Welcome to the last month at the Federal Circuit, a look at recent Federal Circuit decisions impacting the intellectual property community. Finnegan partner Mike Jakes joins us now to review recent developments in the Federal Circuit on patent eligibility under Section 101, including the recent case of Ancora Technologies versus HTC. Mike, 2018 has been an interesting year for patent eligibility under Section 101. Can you start by telling us where we are now in December of 2018? The Federal Circuit's most talked about case this year on patent eligibility is Berkheimer versus Hewlett-Packard. We talked about this case in this podcast a couple of times earlier this year, and it's still attracting attention. As most of the people listening already know, patent eligibility under Section 101 is a question of law. But Berkheimer held that disputed factual issues could preclude summary judgment on this issue. In particular, Berkheimer held that in considering step two of the Alice Mayo test, determining whether certain claim elements or combinations of elements represent well-understood, routine, conventional activities to a person skilled in the art, that's a question of fact. Another case that was decided around the same time, Atrix Software versus Greenshade Software, similarly held that courts should not grant judgment at the pleading stage where there are underlying disputed factual issues. Together, these cases established that the two-step analysis under Section 101 may require first resolving underlying factual issues on the way to deciding eligibility as a matter of law. And what's been the reaction to the Berkheimer and Atrix decisions? The initial reaction was that Berkheimer and Atrix would have a significant impact on patent litigation. These decisions gave patent owners some hope as to how to avoid judgment at an early stage under Section 101. They can draft their complaints by including factual allegations that certain claim elements or combinations of elements are not well understood or routine or conventional activities. Some predicted that these two decisions would result in an increase in the number of cases going to trial. Cases that might otherwise have been filtered out in an earlier stage on a motion to dismiss, for example, or on summary judgment, would then go forward until any potential factual issues were fleshed out. And in fact, that did happen in some district court cases. Right after Berkheimer, there was a decision in Vapor Stream versus Snap Incorporated. That was from the Central District of California. And in that case, there were competing expert declarations as to whether certain claim elements, such as access restrictions, automatic deletion, message IDs, and so on, whether those were well understood, routine, and conventional at the time of the invention. Citing Berkheimer, the district court found there was a genuine factual dispute as to the Alice Step 2 analysis and denied summary judgment. Another district court case, Sycamore IP Holdings versus AT&T, that one is from the Eastern District of Texas, and it reached a similar result. In that case, Federal Circuit Judge Bryson, who was sitting by designation, denied summary judgment of invalidity under Section 101, citing Berkheimer and factual issues. What happens next, though, is up in the air. There are questions such as, will there be discovery and expert reports? Will a judge or a jury then decide the factual issues? Or will eligibility under 101 be treated like claim construction was in Teva? There may be underlying factual issues, but the judge still decides the question. The impact of Berkheimer and Atrix, though, has yet to be seen at the Federal Circuit. Cases like Vapor Stream and Sycamore Holdings, they haven't yet reached the Court of Appeals. So while Berkheimer is the law for now, it's been under attack, starting with efforts to have the full court rehear both Berkheimer and Atrix. Did anything happen with Berkheimer and Atrix on rehearing? So the defendants in both cases, Hewlett Packard and Berkheimer and Green Shade Software and Atrix, filed petitions for rehearing and bank by the full court. There were companies and associations that filed amicus briefs in support. T-Mobile and Sprint filed briefs. Other organizations filing briefs were the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the Internet Association, the Computer and Communications Industry Association, and the High Tech Inventors Alliance. But in both Berkheimer and Atrix, the Federal Circuit denied the petitions for rehearing on the same day. 
Judge Moore wrote an opinion supporting the denial of in-bank rehearing. She called the court's holdings in Berkheimer and Atrix, quote, unremarkable, and said they were well supported by Supreme Court precedent. Judge Lurie wrote a concurring opinion, and there was one lone dissent from Judge Reyna. Four of the Federal Circuit judges didn't join any of the opinions from the order denying in-bank, so it's really not clear whether all the judges are on board at the moment. Mike, how has the Federal Circuit implemented the Berkheimer and Atrix decisions? Berkheimer and Atrix decisions haven't had much impact at the Federal Circuit yet. The court usually hears multiple cases on patent eligibility under 101 every month, and most of those cases have been decided without an opinion under the Federal Circuit's Rule 36. For example, in the last two months, the court has continued to affirm invalidity judgments under 101 in the face of arguments under Berkheimer. Here are some of the more recent cases. One is Mantis Communications versus Edible Arrangements. That was decided in October of 2018. The patents there related to mobile networking technology. They were held invalid for claiming only the idea of mass promotion of marketing and business information. That's the way the district court characterized it. The Federal Circuit was unmoved by the patent owner's arguments under Berkheimer and affirmed without an opinion. Last month, in November 2018, another case, Gale Co. versus Arachnid 360, was decided. That one involved a patent covering a system for refereeing a darts game. The patent owner made systems that connect multiple dart boards together, and that allows players to compete over the Internet. But the district court dismissed the complaint for invalidity under Section 101. This time at oral argument, one of the Federal Circuit judges, Judge Hughes, raised Berkheimer. The patent owner had argued that the combination of a dartboard, a camera, use of the Internet, and so on, was not conventional. So Judge Hughes asked, why isn't that enough to get a factual dispute? The result in that case was the same, though. The court summarily affirmed the dismissal of the complaint for invalidity under 101. Berkheimer was not enough. And there was another similar decision this month in Umbanet versus Epsilon Data Management. The district court had found a patent related to email software valid under 101. And on appeal, the patent owner argued there were factual allegations in the complaint, but the Federal Circuit didn't buy it. It was another Rule 36 affirmance, notwithstanding Berkheimer. So up till now, at least Berkheimer and Atrix haven't had much impact at the Federal Circuit. So are patent owners winning at all on patent eligibility under Section 101? Well, it's not all gloom and doom for patent owners. There is another line of cases following Enfish versus Microsoft where patent owners have had some success on patent eligibility. Enfish is a 2016 case where the Federal Circuit held that claims to self-referential tables, that they were not directed to an abstract idea because they improved the way that computers operated and handled data. These claims to self-referential tables in EnFish allowed the more efficient launching and adaptation of databases because they required less modeling and configuring of various tables before launching. So we have a line between eligible and ineligible under EnFish. On the one side, specific improvements in computer capabilities, which include software, those can be eligible. And on the other side, if you have an otherwise abstract process where the computers are invoked merely as a tool, that falls on the ineligible side. Since EnFish, patent owners have tried to fit their computer or software-related inventions into the First, the computer improvements category, and they have sometimes succeeded, as in the case last month at the Federal Circuit of Ancora Technologies versus HTC. Let's talk about the Ancora case and what we should know about it. Ancora's patent concerned computer security and specifically a technique for preventing operation of unauthorized software on a computer. Before the invention, there were both hardware and software methods for doing this, but according to the patent, neither was satisfactory. For example, hardware methods require inserting a dongle to authenticate a particular program. That doesn't work for software sold and downloaded over the Internet. 
There were also software-based security systems. Those wrote a license signature on the computer's hard drive, but those signatures could be hacked. So the Ancora patent, it first used a key or a unique identification code for the specific computer, which it stored in the read-only portion of the BIOS memory. The BIOS, many people know, it stands for Basic Input and Output System, and the BIOS memory is typically used for storing code that is used to start up the computer when you turn it on. So in the Ancora patent, a license record associated with each application program was also stored in part of the BIOS memory in a modifiable part of the memory. So when an application program was loaded into the computer's memory, the license record in the program was encrypted with the key compared to the one in the modifiable BIOS, and if they don't match, then the application can't run. The new aspect of Ancora's invention was then storing this license record in the BIOS memory and then the steps used to check to see if the program was authorized to run on the computer. The district court didn't buy it. It dismissed Ancora's complaint against HTC on the pleadings, finding the patent claims were invalid under Section 101 as abstract. The court said that the claims were directed to the abstract concept of selecting a program, verifying whether the program is licensed, and acting on the program according to the verification. What did the Federal Circuit decide in Encora? The Federal Circuit reversed based on EnFish. The court found that the claims were not directed to an abstract idea. According to the court in Encora's patent, improving security against unauthorized use of a program was a non-abstract improvement in computer functionality, and it was done by a specific technique to solve a specific computer problem. So the court says the method claimed in Ancora's patent identified specifically how that improvement was accomplished in an unexpected way. This license was stored in a portion of the computer's BIOS memory, and that license, which was a, described as a particular structure, that was used for verification. It had to interact with the other part of the memory that contained the application program to be verified. So in other words, in the court's view, the patent was directed to computer functionality and solved a problem specific to computer application, and therefore it passed Alice Step 1. It wasn't directed to an abstract idea. One thing about this opinion in reaching the decision, the court lays out the EnFish line of cases, first describing EnFish and then a number of cases that have followed it, and it shows how Ancora's patent falls within those precedents. It's a very helpful outline for anyone who's trying to frame an argument under EnFish because it describes the series of cases very well. So what's next for patent eligibility in the federal circuit and elsewhere? Well, first, Berkheimer's still under attack. Hewlett-Packard filed a cert petition in September. There were six amicus briefs filed in support, some from the same companies and organizations as for the petition for rehearing in the federal circuit. The question presented in the petition is interesting. They've raised whether patent eligibility under Section 101 is a question of law for the court based on the scope of the claims or a question of fact for the jury based on the state of the art at the time of the patent. So I said earlier, the question of judge or jury is not yet resolved. So Hewlett-Packard, as well as some of the Amicus argue that submitting questions of patent eligibility to juries will harm both patent owners and accused infringers by introducing uncertainty, delay, and expense into the patent system. Of course, there is a third option, similar to what the Supreme Court did in Teva for claim construction. Patent eligibility could be decided by the court as a matter of law, but with underlying fact issues that don't go to the jury. So as I mentioned, the question of judge or jury hasn't reached the federal circuit yet, and Berkheimer hasn't seemed to slow down the court's affirmance of invalidity judgments under 101 at either the pleading stage or on summary judgment. The Supreme Court should decide whether to take Berkheimer in January, or it could always decide to let things continue as they are for now to see how they work out. But even if the Supreme Court does take Berkheimer, but that won't really solve the problem of uncertainty surrounding eligibility after Allison, the decision of the Supreme Court. 
With all these decisions on patent eligibility, why is there still so much uncertainty? The problem is the Supreme Court's two-step test for determining an abstract idea is difficult to apply. The Federal Circuit and the District Court have been trying to do their best, but they're really struggling to find any consistency at all. Judge Lurie wrote a concurring opinion from the denial of rehearing in Berkheimer. The problem is not Berkheimer, according to Judge Lurie. He said even if the decision in Berkheimer was wrongly decided, it would not solve the current 101 problem and that he thinks Section 101 issues require attention beyond the power of the Federal Circuit. Well, this can seem like a signal to the Supreme Court to step in, but Judge Lurie also pointed out that individual cases, whether they're heard by the Federal Circuit or the Supreme Court, are imperfect vehicles because they're limited to the facts that are presented. Judge Lurie concludes that the law needs clarification by what he calls a higher authority, and by that he really means Congress, to work its way out of what so many people in the innovation field consider Section 101 problems. Now, Judge Plager, a senior judge on the Federal Circuit, he was more blunt in his assessment of the state of the law under 101. He wrote a concurring opinion a few months ago in interval licensing versus AOL, and he called what the court is doing the continued application of an incoherent body of doctrine, where he said the state of law is, quote, such as to give little confidence that the outcome is necessarily correct. Those are strong words. Judge Plager noted that the Supreme Court would not necessarily have the incentive to step in to try to fix the problems with the current law on patent eligibility. Instead, he welcomed Judge Lurie's call for help from Congress. He concluded his concurring opinion by saying, this emperor clearly has no clothes. We need not wait for our children to tell us this. And a former chief judge of the Federal Circuit, Judge Michel, who speaks frequently on these topics, he didn't pull any punches either in expressing what many think of the current state of the law. He said that the Supreme Court's cases have unintentionally created mass uncertainty, devalued countless thousands of patents, wrongly excluded many technological advances that should be eligible and are in other advanced countries, including all European countries, Japan, and even China. And he would welcome Congress acting as well. And finally, Mike, are there any solutions to the current problems with Section 101 on the horizon? There is a rising call for legislation to help fix these problems. AIPLA and the Intellectual Property Owners, IPO, have drafted proposals to overhaul Section 101. They are getting some attention. Senators Chris Coons of Delaware and Tom Tillis of North Carolina, they just held a roundtable to discuss the need for legislative reform on Section 101. They invited tech companies, industry groups, the bar associations to this roundtable. And so we'll see what comes of that. It's a start at least. Our guest has been Mike Jakes, a partner at Finnegan, one of the largest IP law firms in the world. For more commentary on intellectual property news and issues, to listen to other podcasts, and to receive additional information on the firm, please visit www.finnegan.com. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Finnegan.